Hello, everybody. It's five o'clock on June 18th, and uh, this is the recorded part of it. The residency will basically be a lecture. Uh, I, will, I will talk to you, I will give you words of wisdom, and I will go over a little bit that your, your case for accounting 584, which you can tune out if you're not going to take accounting 584, but I think most of you will. So I will just show you the data sets, talk a little bit about what you might have to do there. So an informative lecture, an interesting lecture, and a review of what you have to do for 584. Uh, we have our last week ahead, and here we go. This is module six. It's uh, two tests, an idea case, and a normal, slightly longer than normal case, uh, but I think you'll get through it, no problem. And the residency session, you'll get the link for that as well on Friday. And I just told you what Friday will be. This is module six. I had to update it. It's going to, I'm going to update it again later tonight and put the uh, link for this exact recording in. Uh, this is the, the link for our residency session and uh, a note on what videos are available for what. Um, your case has got two parts. K6 has got two parts. It looks like this. K6, 2000. There we go. It has one part on Nathan Mueller. And Nathan Mueller is read an article, answer the questions. This isn't too stressful. Part two asks you to do some analysis and also to uh, select one vendor from the 20 largest vendors that you want to audit for fraud. I'll just give you a little background on this one. This is a reasonably serious part here. And I'll share this with you. Uh, we are accredited. And I was told to develop a case or something that tested these two learning objectives. Can you apply electronic techniques? Can you analyze and interpret what you've just done? So K6 part two is intended to measure these two things. Um, you don't have to worry too much. You basically just have to do it. And then I will grade it and assess whether, whether this thing has, um, whether I've done what I needed to do. That not everybody is supposed to meet the standard and get full points. Apparently, um, if everybody can do whatever the task is assigned, the task wasn't hard enough. However, if everybody does get everything correct, I'm fine. I'll just live with it and we'll all be even happier. I've got two suggestions. First, make a copy of the data set, delete all the fields that you don't need so that uh, uh, the only thing that you have left over is what you're gonna be working with. And second, create an example data set with say 20 records where you basically know what the answer is going to be. Run the test on these 20 records and then do exactly the same with Summerville, knowing that at least your method is correct. So you can take a screenshot of this. You can read it slowly in your own time. Even though it is terribly important, I think it will only count, where is it? There it is. Uh, this part two will count maybe a quarter of the grade. So 75 points for this, 25 points for this, Today, we're going to start talking about idea, the two chapters, and we have two other topics to cover there as well. This is your idea assignment for this week. It looks something like this. Uh, you don't really have to worry too much about the opening blurb, but you're going to be doing a reasonable amount of work. You can see there are 15 requirements. And basically what this is, it is, all the things that we haven't yet done, or all the important things that we've done before and we're gonna do again, this is our last case. This is kind of the final hurrah. And here is a little, a little extra for, for you that are attending. I've spoken this, about this before, the academic CIDA exam. This is it. When you get onto the correct, I will, I will post the link in our forum called IDEA. Uh, you can go through here and it talks about this 
Academic Certified Idea Data Analyst exam. Uh, when you sign up, it will welcome you and it will say it's only for students. So you can write the exam. You're good to go. You're good to go for the whole summer. Uh, I wrote the exam yesterday. So this is what I had to do. I had to confirm my location. I had to pay. However, um, idea were very kind and they gave me a coupon code, which I'm sorry, I blurred out over there, but it took my $20 down to zero. Um, for you, you don't have any coupon code. It's going to set you back at 20. Welcome to the exam. This exam is only for students. Although I wrote it yesterday, I just pretended I was a student. Nobody knows. Uh, status not started. Here we go. And apparently at some stage you can do click start. You have three tries and you have four hours each time. Here we go. I got an email saying, Mark, you have been enrolled in the following course. If you have any questions, Caseware University. So now I'm writing an exam, uh, not started, and I click start. Exam instructions, 30 multiple choice questions. 10 of them have to do with data analysis. You have to actually analyze the data and answer the questions. You have four hours, complete it by yourself. At the end of my 40 minutes, you can see my score was 90%. So I didn't get everything correct. Uh, passing score, 70%. I don't feel too bad. Um, again, this is just a bit more of the screenshot saying that I've completed the course. Uh, time taken, your score passed. I even got a nice certificate. Uh, you can applaud if you like and give me a thumbs up. But now I have a certificate of expertise. It did not come easy. Uh, just like Ringo Starr said a while back. I did have to work through the, this workbook. And we have the workbook in our idea folder. I went through it. It's about 280 pages. I managed around 50 pages a day, which didn't take me the whole day, but that was as much of idea as I could take in a day. I then did the sample questions and data files. So they have a question sample. They have some data files over here and used, it's kind of a practice exam. And this is what the practice exam looks like. Uh, Import the file, and here is one of the questions. There we go, here. Uh, yeah. So these are the 10 questions. What is the field separator? How many records? Uh, index the database. And so you'll have to figure out from the workbook that in idea terminology, index means sort. Uh, they ask about a specific record. They talk about a join, and we've done joins in our class. What is the user ID over here? This was one I got wrong. The fourth digit in the ID field represents the department. Create a new field called department with only the department number in it. So what you do, you have a string of characters and you have to haul out the fourth digit and the fourth digit only, and it asks you, which of these formulas will work? I answered A. The correct answer was all of the above. So it's a tricky question. I didn't bother to check whether the other two would work as well. I just knew A will work. I answer A. Um, how many websites? How many minutes? For this question, I got the answer almost correct. I was off by about two. 
and you can see that these are very big numbers. And because I'm off by two, I think it's just a case of I rounded slightly differently to the way that they rounded when they did it. And so it was just a, a toss up. Do I, do I take their answer or do I say none of the above because I'm off by two? Uh, when I say I'm off by two, my answer could have been 64351.75. Da -da -da, and they give you the solutions and you should be good if you can if you can get a 90 on this you should be pretty much good to go i think this is very nice to for 20 dollars to get this and you can put academic cida on your resume and after your name this is the charlene corley case um has anybody read it i can see a yes i can see a yes I think this was very exciting. Um, the fraud is relevant to our topic because $20 million was stolen, nine years. It has some of the attributes of a cyber attack. I talk about what a cyber attack is and they meet the requirements here. And we talk about a terrible lack of controls. This is Charlene's indictment. The short story goes from being very interesting to even more interesting. These are just a few photos of uh, what Charlene's warehouse as such looked like. And so basically what happened was we had a lack of controls here. They were billing the government for items supplied and the system, the government system did not check the shipping charges. It pretty much paid the shipping charges automatically. So here we have some examples of fraudulent transactions, contract number, invoice date, item, cost of the items, and the shipping with a fraudulent shipping amount paid. Cost of the items, fraudulent shipping charge paid. Fraudulent shipping charge paid. It gets worse. Fraudulent shipping paid. This is all on one date. About $130 worth of items, fraudulent shipping, 1.3 million. And they got caught right at the end because of this charge over here. A washer and a lock, 38 cents. They billed 998, 798, 38 for shipping, and it was paid. And they got caught because they billed again under the same uh, contract number for that much shipping, and it was picked up as a duplicate payment. If you want to look at a bit of a movie, you can do this. The um, series is called Evil Twins, and the episode is called Green-Eyed Monsters. And I uh, will just give you a little taste, maybe a minute and a half. And if you're at a family gathering, you can always just go inside now, put on the television and show everybody this episode. And of course you can tell them that your professor is a, a movie star. You also have to read the last chapter in the book. These are my concluding notes and these are my thoughts. Uh, you do have a test 6B deals with this. So you are gonna have to do some reading over there. Um, I talk about the economics of crime model, and it is rather strange, but this economic model basically says that many people will commit occupational fraud if the correct situation presents itself. The model is set out in terms of expected utility. Utility means your happiness gained from some other activity. Uh, or the, the year goes satisfaction, and uh, they do some calculus on the model. Basically, an increase in the chance of detection and conviction would reduce the utility expected from the offense, and an increase in the monetary equivalent of the punishment would also reduce the expected utility. And it almost seems as if people don't fear detection and they don't much fear um, punishment. But this uh, first thing of year, I think, is, is quite telling. Many people will commit occupational fraud if the correct uh, activity of the correct situation presents itself. 
I talk a little bit about internal controls, and these are the controls that we care about, detective controls. We would like to detect errors or incidents that have eluded the preventative controls. I thought this was very interesting, fraud detection methods, and sadly, data analytics or proactive fraud detection is nowhere to be found near the top. Harriet. Um, I had some emails about the Harriet case during the week and I was very happy. If any of the cases in the book, um, if, if you know anything more about them or you have some exciting photos you can share with me of the location or the person or something like that, I would uh, love to see it. And from time to time, I do get interesting things from students. Um, Christopher Davis sent me this uh, way back in 2020. And these are photos of the jewelry store that Harriet Walters used. And um, can anybody remember how much Harriet spent over there? More than a million, more than a million. And it's rather uh, striking that nobody asked her where she gets her money from. So this is uh, more of a door jewelers. If you have anything you'd like to share with me or a case that isn't in the book and you think I would find it interesting, please let me know. Um, so we're gonna move on here to your case six. And we're gonna move on to Nathan Mueller. So you have to read the Journal of Accountancy article and then answer these questions. But between now and then, I'm gonna give you just a little talk about me and Nathan. There we go. Nathan's fraud scheme. I usually start off by asking whether the audience thinks whether fraudsters take personal responsibility for their actions. And just in general, you can show me a sign uh, with your hands or your head. Um, do you think they take personal responsibility? Generally, no. This is back to Harriet again. When Harriet was sentenced, so on the day she sentenced, she talks to the judge and she says to the federal judge, if you put me back in there today, Walters told the federal judge, I could get each of you a check. So taking responsibility, definitely no. I was friends with Ryan. Ryan worked in that factory. Uh, he was the accountant and Ryan embezzled $1.2 million. You might or might not remember, but Ryan is in chapter one in our book. I was also friends with Adi, who was a, a head of internal audit. And she told me, oh, back to you. I knew Ryan. Ryan was in prison with Nathan and Ryan said, you should meet Nathan. I was friends with Odie. Odie was a head of internal audit at a company in Minnesota. And they had Nathan over to talk to the auditors, actually while Nathan was in prison. And she said, you have to meet Nathan. So I thought this is very exciting. And I contacted Nathan and we got to corresponding with each other. Nathan then sent me what he called his fraud narrative. You can see Nathan Mueller, Federal Prison Camp, Duluth, Minnesota. And this is addressed to me, Mark Negrini at West Virginia University. I thought this was terribly exciting. In the package was Nathan's fraud narrative. At that time, I was teaching external auditing and external auditing is a little bit dull, uh, lots of rules and procedures. So at the end of each class, we would spend about 15 minutes talking about Nathan and Nathan's case. And that made our auditing class a little more interesting or a lot more interesting. So this is Nathan talking and this is his full narrative. I discovered I had the ability to approve check requests. So we always knew that he could request checks, but now he finds out that he can approve checks. This was a small accounting department. We all knew each other's passwords. 
which was a practical workaround for a small department of five people, because sometimes we just had to get things done. I think we have a comedian who said something like, we had to get her done. But my American accent, not so good. Um, I realized I could log in as one of the other employees, request a check, log in as myself and approve the check. I went to work every day saying I shouldn't do this. The tipping point came with my wife's first pregnancy. And basically, if we think of the fraud triangle, this adds to financial pressure. Well, my initial plan was to pay off one of my credit cards, the AT&T Universal Citibank Visa. So he decides to request a check with Universal as the payee. Um, and it was only for $1,100. So he requested the check. He logged on as somebody else, approved the check. He got hold of the check, sent it to the credit card company, and lo and behold, $1,100 gets credited to his account. Over the summer, I requested fraudulent checks totaling 88,000. My debts were fully paid off. And you would think that this is, of course, the end of Nathan's fraud scheme. Well, you would be wrong. My first scare came when a $4,500 check didn't clear in the normal amount of time. And this was because he hadn't put his account number on the check. What happened was the bank received the check. They didn't know what to do with it. They then sent it back to the head office in Atlanta and head office in Atlanta forwarded the check to him. And Nathan then at least got hold of his uh, check again. The one thing about this paragraph is when an accountant commits fraud in the organization, it is very hard to detect because he can journalize his own fraud and he can also see what's happening in the accounting system. When somebody not in accounting tries to pull off the stunt, they really can't look up the records and see what, what's happening with their fraudulent transactions. Well, Nathan decides using the credit card is just too much work. He now registers a business called ACE Business Consulting, and he now requests checks payable to ACE and deposits the ACE checks into his account. He says, my first fraudulent check was for around 27,000. This is after the credit cards. Uh, he talks about being nervous, but walking up to the teller, handing it over for deposit, and everything going smoothly. When all was said and done, I had taken $8.455 million. He says, I joke, was well, not a funny joke, sir. I stole one million in 2004, then two million, then four million, but only one million in 2007. The 2007 cutback was basically because Nathan got caught. Um, we'll talk about how he got caught later on, but we're talking about the investigators coming to his door on a Monday night, um, talking loudly to him. He wouldn't let them in. After closing the door, I had to go in and explain everything to my pregnant girlfriend who was listening to the conversation. So Nathan, Nathan's ending up with a complicated life over here. I had tracked my gambling for years. I gave the FBI spreadsheets of all the information they would need. I gave them bank records, credit card statements, tax returns. They commented that fraudsters like me do not normally keep such great records. And of course, Nathan could keep great records because Nathan was a CPA as competent as you or I. Here we go. Indictment, United States of America versus Nathan John Mueller. And if you take anything away from this class, it should be the fact that you never, ever want a document in this world that starts off with the words United States of America versus followed by Followed by our name. By your name, yes. <laughs> Um, and I also don't want that, so I behave myself. And watch very carefully here. Count one, mail fraud, that's it. 
you just have to use the mail once and it's enough to get you a terribly hefty uh, sentence and Nathan used the mail when he mailed those um, checks to the credit card company for payment against his account. Uh, mail fraud again, one, just one count. They just have to show that you had a fraud scheme going and you used the mail once, 97 months. That's a long, long time. There we go. Uh, Nathan was FPC Duluth, not even a big fence around the prison. The first time I ever gave a Nathan Wheeler talk, I asked the audience, um, which one of the four people that I'm going to show you now was Nathan? And they struggled a little bit. So I'm going to ask you again of the photo that I'm going to show you, who is Nathan? I then got an email from my internal auditor friend, and she says I was at the prison today helping with interviews. Uh, the organizer told us about Nate and how he got in contact with, uh, touch with Professor Negrini. Nate is studying forensic accounting, is excited and opportunities for speaking. I also ran into Nate, so as you can realize, this is not high security when you can just run into people. He's excited about getting out. You've made a big difference, giving him some focus. Good to hear all the good things about you and Nate. So I thought, well, this was very nice. And just a little story. I'm just checking my notes here. Ah, So how did Nathan launder his money? Well, when you get a whole 8 million extra dollars, you need to keep the fact that this money has been embezzled secret from who? First of all, the bank, right? First of, first of all, who? The bank. Well, your, 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 your employer, yes. Yeah. Um, the bank. But also... Your family, your significant others, etc family significant other uh, you've got an extra eight million bucks you're playing with my social laundering would work as follows i would accumulate large amounts of cash i would take the cash to the casino play the high dollar slot machines when i hit a jackpot i would go home and tell everybody i'd won money at the casino i didn't care if i had to play twenty thousand to win 10 because i could always steal more money I needed that W2G that proved that I had won money. Um, and so this is how he kind of launders the money to begin with. But the biggest skeptic of the time was my wife. Remember, Harriet did not have a spouse. Two things happened that convinced her that I was lucky at casinos. And he's talking about two trips over here where he won 56,000. Again, she joined me just as I won 6,250. She won, she watched me when I hit a $100,000 jackpot. And um, the wife could say she was there and she saw it with her, with her own eyes. But again, you do have to remember the number of people that um, go to casinos and win consistently are very few and far between. That's why the casinos have very nice buildings. I did blotch something out here, but this is what a W2G looks like. It says gross winnings, slot, uh, and it almost proves that you want it, gambling. There we go, gambling. We're back. We have to publish. Uh, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So I wrote to the Journal of Accountancy and proposed this topic over here and what i was basically aiming for was to write an article about this because when the cfo him or herself steals number one it's big and number two it's hard to detect because they are journalizing their own fraud well they come back and says uh isn't right for us and they don't like it if you have any direct quotes from some of the fraudsters whom you've met in person, I think hearing directly from the fraudsters could be powerful and might lay the foundation for a good story. 
I thought, well, this is very exciting. I think I know just the person. It took about three weeks and I wrote up an outline and you can see up top there, it looks pretty dull because it's just in black and white text. However, I had Nathan's fraud narrative, how I did the fraud. I then said how we could have prevented and detected the fraud. And then we wrap up with some lessons that we could learn. I talked to some of Nathan's friends. I talked to some of Nathan's friends and got this from his friend, John. I read that and you tell me, you tell me if there's anything there that, that might suggest that Nathan, Nathan might do what he did. And so the lesson from, from, from those high school photos that, that I want you to take away is Nathan looks like any other high school student. There is nothing to say he looks different or is different or something to that effect. So this makes detection all that much harder. We are, we are trying to find somebody that absolutely just fits in with being an accountant and being an accountant at work. When I went to Las Vegas to uh, give a talk and do some training there, and I asked Nathan what he did, and I also asked Nathan um, how he made up his fraud numbers. So he said he had a bit of OCD when it came to numbers. These were his jersey numbers, uh, and he was very good at hockey and football. And so what he did was he used these digits in his fraudulent checks. I don't remember the exact amounts, um, but he, he could have used something like this, 27053. I then asked Nathan again about his numbers and he came and told me uh, the same story. So I ask you, when, when Nathan uses some specific digits repeatedly, to kind of tag his numbers, does that make it easier for us to detect him or harder? Easier. It makes it easier. The moment he wants to tag his numbers with a little special fingerprint, and I've seen this before where people tag the numbers so that they know which is a fraudulent number by just looking at the transaction, it makes it easier. Well, I have to write my part. And I basically said for the first one there, Nathan got hired by ING as a result of a takeover of Reliostar. <clears throat> and when you are taking over a company, you are getting employees that probably don't like you, that never wanted to work for you, and that you don't even know from a bar of soap. So what I suggest was when you get 6,000 new employees as a result of a takeover, you do a background check light. See who you're getting. Well, the editor came back and said, ask Nathan, what would have happened if they'd done a background check on him? I asked Nathan and Nathan said, my credit score was horrible. So I ask you, you have 2,000 new employees, and you see Nathan among them with a horrible credit score, what would you think? What would you do? Well, I feel like it would raise a red flag because if, you know, they're assessing things at face value and they know his position, they know that he was an accountant, and to see that he had a bad credit score, it'd be like, oh, okay, like, this doesn't add up. You should be good with your money, right? I couldn't have put it better myself. It's because he's the accountant. If he was in charge of uh, something else, uh, some, uh, some, uh, something that didn't involve money, not such a big flag. The next we are the controls that we need in an accounting system. Well, the processing controls are to see, just to, to check for arithmetic accuracy. But this fact that they knew each other's passwords and they logged on as the other person to get her done just broke almost every rule about controls. Physical safeguards. 
Nathan was able to get his hands on the check, the paper check. And because he could get his hands on the paper check, he could take the paper check. Uh, we saw not too long ago, somebody else who could also get her hands on the paper check. And who was that? Harriet. Harriet could get hold of the paper check. Again, a terrible flaw in internal control or something needed by somebody that's going to steal. Nathan said I was the only one that knew how the PeopleSoft system worked. This is something you're going to have to live with sometimes. One person or two people are the only people who know how a system works. You just have to realize it makes them high risk. Fraud awareness training. Um, had people just known more about fraud awareness, possibly Nathan's fraud could have been detected because he surely lived the high life. I'm going to move ahead and show you some photos here of Nathan's high life, and then we'll come back to this. Nathan's car. Nice car? Yes. Very nice car. That RS4 badge in front, very nice. Nathan's other car. You might think to yourself, well, this is kind of an old model uh, car. Well, it was 2007, 2006 at the time. That car was very nice. Nathan loved his expensive watches. In fact, well, these aren't photos of his watches. These are just photos of watches that he had. Uh, that was a $23,000 watch. And he said he enjoyed working, wearing that one to work. Um, also, Nathan parked his car a little further away than what everybody else parked because he knew it was too nice for his uh, income. We'll move back. Abnormal transactions. That $4,500 check that just appeared at the bank with no record of what it was for, had somebody of your abilities or my abilities gone into it in depth and said exactly what is happening here, Nathan's fraud could then have been stopped at 88,000 and not at 8.45 million. And the last point is, anybody that can add new vendors to the payroll, is a risk of being able to do it. Well, I can show you more of this, but this is the editor and this the, the black is me and the red is the editor. When the editor does all this work with all the red over there, does it mean they like your work or they don't like your work and you're very bad? Alan? I think he's just parsing it so that he can give the narrative in his own way. No, <laughs> they love your work. They think you're doing a great job. Um, if they didn't like your work, they wouldn't even give you any red. They would tell you to, um, to have a nice day. I'm just gonna switch through these quickly again because we've done them. This was all that was left of 8.45 million. Uh, we won't spend too much time in it, but if you add the two numbers up, uh, the two subtotals, three quarters of a million. Uh, this is the Journal of Accountancy. Your article was well received. Just a couple of questions. Uh, did he do more than abuse alcohol? And this is very good, no guarantees yet. So, this, this job is high risk. Uh, they just keep you dangling till, till they feel like saying yes. And finally, just before Memorial Day, hope this email finds you well. I've written short bios for you and Nate. It carries on with author's agreements. And I'm thinking this is very, very nice. I called him and said, are we in? He said, you're in. I was very happy. Um, they do this round, and this round is called Fatal Flaw. And they give you one last chance before things get finally typeset and to check for any errors. 
Well, Nathan and I, we went with, through it with a fine tooth comb and Nathan came back. Nathan wants this changed. Nathan wants this changed. Nathan wants an, a change over here. And the point I want to make is Nathan is a CPA as good as you or I. Nathan was highly qualified. Nathan could do a good job. That's why he could steal. Um, I went to Las Vegas. And again, this is where I said to Nathan, tell me about what you did. Uh, I would like to... I would like to go to wherever you went, which is also why I would like photos from you if you, if you go to any of the locations uh, of the frauds in the book. He talks about going down on a Thursday. He talks about his uh, weary ate, beer drinker, rock shrimp, bone-in fillet, cheesy potatoes. Uh, he went to the Playboy Club, which isn't there anymore. Have fun. So I thought, this is exciting. I found Nathan's restaurant. And so there I am having the exact same meal that Nathan had. I finished my shrimp and this is the um, filet and the cheesy potatoes and the exact same beer that Nathan had. Uh, this was a while back. And you can see there my total at the bottom. And when your total is that high, you have to give a tip that's also in line with $117.10. So it ended up being quite expensive, but I enjoyed it. Um, Nathan said to me, when you go to the casino, ask anybody if they remember me. I thought, I'm not gonna go to a casino on the strip in Las Vegas and ask them if they remember Nathan. But I did go and I saw, is, is it the bellman? Is that what it's called? The, the person in charge of the luggage right near the entrance. I went to the bellman and I said, uh, I, I'm a professor. I know Nathan Mueller. Uh, I just wanted to know, do you know Nathan? And he looked at me and he looked away and he looked at his friend, Eddie, who was a, a short while away. And he said, hey, Eddie, he knows Nate. So they not only knew Nate, they remembered Nate from seven years later. Uh, we got into the Journal of Accountancy. We got uh, top billing there with the lead story. There it is, me and Nathan. And of course, this is the article that you're going to read. You can see that Nathan and I are both authors. I didn't do it as if I'd uh, interviewed Nathan. And you're going to have to read that. How was Nathan caught? Nathan's wife was friends with one of the co-workers. They were having lunch. And the wife said, you know, or the ex-wife, I really can't believe how Nathan is always so lucky at the casino. And the co-worker has thought about this for a while. She ran a query which said, which checks did I request uh, in the past year and included in that list that came up were all, huge amounts of checks payable to ACE that she didn't recognize. And that was the end of Nathan's fraud. Uh, this publication also contacted Nathan. They wanted an interview there. Um, you can take a screenshot of it if you like, you can go look for it. It is very insightful. I took that out. Um, this is Nathan being home. I'm home now. It's quite an adjustment. I'm still trying to get settled in. He said, I'll, I'll get back to you when, when I can. And by the way, this is a table in the book. And this is talking about predictors that can be used to find fraudulent vendors. Um, I just give you that. It's in the book. You can look it up. I'm back home. It's a pain. I have to do all these things. I don't like landscaping. And I would also not like landscaping if I was a highly competent accountant. Um, and Nathan's asking if he can use me as a reference. And I said, of course, sure you can. Uh, there were a few other things waiting for Nathan, including this from the IRS. I've blotched out all the details. But 
total taxes due, including interest and penalties for 2007, you can see the amount. For 2006, you can see the amount. And these are, of course, highly stressful bits of correspondence. I then thought about Nathan and I presenting at the ACFE, and I thought, this is quite easy. Uh, I will propose to them that we present to them. Uh, I'll give, I have all this. We've published the article. I have the um, summaries. I will make a, a case that we should present. And they came back and they said, yes, you and Nathan can present together. And that's what they said in December. And then in January, they contacted me again and said, no, you present by yourself. Nathan can be the conference closing speaker. And what you can do is you can introduce Nathan at the end of the conference. So Nathan was the guest speaker for that conference. This was 2015 in Baltimore. You can see here keynote speakers and special guest, special guest closing session, Wednesday, June 17th, Nathan Mueller. Until that time, I hadn't met Nathan. We hadn't spoken to each other. Everything was email or US post. Um, I have the Lawler Award, it's right up there. We won the award for the best article in 2014, the reasonably prestigious Lawler Award. I was very happy for that. So this is me at the 2015 ACFE conference. You can read the title of my talk. And as you can guess, I was almost like the opening act. Nathan was the real act. And I was opening, there I am, opening for Nathan. There I am introducing Nathan. That's where I meet Nathan for the very first time. And afterwards we have a nice talk. And I was quite interested. That lunch was right near the conference venue. And several people walked up to the table and I thought they're gonna to talk to me because I thought I'm halfway famous. No, they didn't want to talk to me. They completely bypassed me. They just wanted to talk to Nathan. And thank you for the presentation. Thank you for sharing your story. It was all very insightful. So after a while, when people walked up to the table, I didn't bother to uh, look up. We've done a few um, presentations together. Um, this is Williamsburg Fraud Conference. You can see right at the bottom of the page, speakers, Nathan and I. This is another conference, the two speakers, Nathan and I. And when we team up, basically what happens is <coughs> I talk about Nathan's fraud from my perspective, he talks about it from his perspective and the audience find it very interesting. This is Nathan talking by himself in Pittsburgh. Um, this is the 2018 fraud conference and amazingly, their special guest speaker was Ryan. And if you remember again, Ryan is in chapter one in my book. They keep using my friends and they don't pay me for it. I'm gonna have a word with them. You need a referral fee. Quite right. I need, I need a big referral fee because this is not the only one. At the residence, I'll post again, Gary Foster, another one of my friends, they used him again. So I need to talk to them. Have you gotten in touch with uh, Jordan Belfer yet? <laughs> yes, yes, stop taking my convict friends. And, and not giving me a cut. Anyway, I keep in touch with Ryan. Again, Ryan is in chapter, chapter one. Uh, we keep in contact a few times a year. This again is Nathan, again, uh, 2018, we keep in contact. So I've enjoyed my association with both Ryan and Nathan. We're just going to close out Nathan there. And here we go. This is your reward for hanging around all this time. Uh, test 6A, practice questions. Let's see if we can do it and we can finish maybe 602, 603.
and it's 22.44 percent in her case. Uh, I couldn't hear anything. 22.44 percent, I think. You think, but you're close. Let's have a look here. This is the indictment. Okay, they submitted 499 false invoices and they were paid on 112 of them. Yeah. So I'm gonna let you go. They were paid 112 out of 499. That percentage is? 2244 22.44. Uh, the assets listed, how many, Edis, I don't know, is it Edisto Island beach houses did they have? Four. 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 Mm -hmm. Good answer. I only have three beach houses, you know, and I'm fine. I'm fine. If I get bored with them, I just go to a Marriott. Six B. Adversarial process. Good call. The answer to number one is adversarial. As usual, you know, I don't give you the letter because it'll it'll jumble it for you. I went to see him being sentenced, and I do have photos of him as he was leaving the courthouse. Yeah. And he was he was an attorney, and he just took money out of the trust account. Best described as? Asset misappropriation. Good call. Mm -hmm. Asset. Grand. Asset. That's not grand larceny. No, larceny is when you, like, take money from, like, okay, never mind. <laughs> I think it has to be, like, a, over some threshold or something. We call that. But... It's, it's asset misappropriation. Okay. I'm going to tell you the wrong answer now, and I'm going to tell you why A, or corruption, is wrong. Corruption is generally linked to bribery and kickbacks. Yeah. It's where you get... Uh, corruption is, is where you get some advantage from your job that you're not entitled to. And bribery and kickbacks fall into that scheme. So the answer for number three is asset misappropriation.